Amen. Jason. Good morning. Grace to you and peace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Glad that you are all here. I'm glad that the fans are already out and being used. Does everybody have one that needs one? I think there's is there like a basket of them somewhere. Is that right? Everybody doing okay? Okay. A couple of announcements this morning before we get started with worship. Uh, we continue to Mass. If, uh, if you're joining us on Zoom this morning, if you have joys and concerns for our uh, prayers of the people time, please put those in the chat now. Uh, a few announcements that are not on the slides. The church uh, is going to be sponsoring or helping to sponsor a, a local um, Juneteenth festival, Juneteenth and Father's Day festival uh, that's going to be taking place at the high school uh, on June 18th. Um, if you get the, the Chimes newsletter that's coming out every week now, uh, there was a flyer in there this week. One of the things that uh, I was on a organization meeting yesterday for this event with Margaret, uh, they're going to be looking for volunteers to actually make, make to, you know, help this thing actually take place. Uh, people to set up and walk around, make sure everything's going okay. I would love it if uh, we had several folks from the church or as many as possible help volunteer to, to be a part of that. It's going to be uh, the 18th, which is a Saturday. Uh, the event itself is from one to four in the afternoon. Setup is going to be that morning. Um, if you would like some more information, uh, you can talk to me, but really you should probably talk to Margaret Stevens because she is the one who is really helping uh, get this thing organized. There's going to be no confirmation class next week because it's going to be Memorial Day and I'm going to be out of town and Andy is so we're going to um, take next week off and then we'll get back the next week after that and then three weeks from today we will confirm our youth uh, on June 12th so that's going to be an exciting day. Next week the Presby players are going to present um, resurrection people uh, for us for, during the service which is going to be great. I'm sad that I'm going to be able to miss that, but thank you for, for doing that. Um, and then again, about the Chimes uh, newsletter that's being sent out by email, if you're not getting that yet, please uh, send Mary or Harry or me a um, note saying that, and we'll make sure to get your, your email address added to that. Um, things that are going in there are um, announcements about stuff going on in the church, in the community. Uh, about what the food pantry is asking for, uh, different things like that. It's, it's going to be a really good way to help keep everybody uh, informed about what's going on. And then also, uh, we just launched an updated website this week for the church. So it's um, mostly done, but it's still sort of under construction. So if you see things that need to be fixed or if there's typos or something like that, let me know and we'll work on getting that fixed. Um, I think that is it. Are there, oh, Christian Ed. There's gonna be a brief five minute Christian Ed meeting uh, directly after worship right here, um, specifically where Harry is sitting. Um, so I think that's it. Did I miss anything else? Okay, Ms. Dolores is gonna come up for our welcome. Good morning. We have any visitors? Anyone visiting us for the first time? No one? Well, hearing that, I welcome us back into the sanctuary. Enjoy the service. Please join me in our call to worship. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Please join me in prayer. O God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Pour into our hearts such love for you that loving you above all else we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. not let your hearts be troubled, but confess your sins and God will give you peace. Please join with me in our prayer of confession. Loving God, we confess that we are an anxious people. We deny your blessing and fail to keep your word. Forgive us, we pray, for these and all our sins, that we might live in peace and reflect your love in the world. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. God, in your mercy. Friends, as far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Go forth and live in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Living God, you sent your apostle to preach the gospel. The women gathered by a river in a secluded place of prayer. There a businesswoman named Lydia was led by the spirit to hear your word as truth. She opened her heart in love. And she opened her home for the spreading of the gospel. 
So by the power of your Holy Spirit, fling wide the doors of our hearts this day as we hear your word of life, that we too may open our lives to serve your wor world in love. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16. It is that story of Lydia. Listen now for the word of the Lord. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace. The following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside to the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a, a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Amen. I'm going to ask our youth and children to come forward for our children's chat. I'm going to move that up a little bit. Come on down. Good morning. One. All right. Good. Good morning. All right. I need a couple of folks to tell me something interesting about yourself. What's an interesting fact about you? Any volunteers? Ask what instruments they play. Okay. What instruments do you play? I play the saxophone. Saxophone. Clarinet, do you play an instrument? No? Do you sing? No? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. The, bells. the what? The bells. the bells, yes. The baritone. Baritone. Baritone and banjo. All right. Any other instruments? I play the trombone and a little bit of baritone. All right. So let me see if I can get this, get this right. So you said you play the baritone, you play the clarinet, right? You play the saxophone, you play the baritone, and you play the bell kit. Did I get that right? All right, let me try again. You play the bell kit, you play the saxophone, you play the clarinet, you play violin, and you play, don't tell me, baritone. No, I didn't get that right again. Why didn't I get that right? Probably because I didn't listen. I was just sort of in my head when you guys were, when you guys were talking, just thinking about other stuff. So it's important that we listen to people, right? When they tell us something important about them, yeah? The story that we're going to read in just a minute, the Bible story, is a story about Jesus listening to somebody. He's, it's a healing story, but it's not the same as all the other healing stories. He goes up to him and asks him if he wants to be healed, and this guy says, well, actually, I just can't get to where I need to go. And Jesus sits there and doesn't try to tell him that he's wrong or anything. He listens to him so that he actually understands what's going on with this guy's with, with, with his, his problem. Is it important that we listen to people when they tell us what's going on with them? Yeah? Yeah, any idea why it might be important? Yeah? Because you can help them? Yeah, absolutely. Any else? Any others? Yeah? To be able to understand them better. To be able to understand them better, absolutely. Yeah. To be friends with them, absolutely, yeah. To help them out, to better understand. If somebody is going through a rough time, who do you think knows the most about that? Probably the person going through the rough time, right? Yeah, it's important that we listen to them and not try to just go in and immediately just fix it and just try to make everything better. So I wanna challenge you all, if somebody comes to you at some point this week and has something hard with them, just listen to them. You don't have to immediately try to fix it, but listen to them and to try to understand what it is that's going wrong with them. And then just say, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard, you know? You just have to listen, all right? You guys say a prayer with me? All right. Dear Lord, Dear Lord thank, you thank you for giving us ears, giving us ears to, listen, to listen and for hearts, and for hearts to care. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming. If you guys are going to go to Children's Church, you can follow Miss Betsy. I hear Trivial Pursuit is in the plan for today.
So our sermon text for today comes from Gospel of John. Interestingly, uh, it comes from John chapter 5. Interestingly, this is the only time in the three-year lectionary cycle that the fifth chapter of John comes up for whatever reason. I don't know why. But I figured we'd jump at our chance to talk about this, take up on this opportunity, because this is a unique healing story in, in John's gospel. Uh, just before this story, Jesus had been in the city of Canaan, or a city of Cana, which if we all remember, that was where Jesus's first miracle took place in the gospel of John, where he turned the water into wine, for which we are thankful. And then he's come again, and now he has healed a, 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 another person in the city of Cana. He's specifically healed a royal official's son uh, from a potential deadly fever. Um, and he does it just by telling this man that he's been healed. There's no like actual going over and doing it. He just says, your son has been healed. And then we are told that Jesus does an immediate U-turn in his travel. So he leaves Canaan, which is up in the north in Galilee, and travels back south to Jerusalem for an unnamed festival. And so that is where our story picks up today. Listen now for the word of the Lord. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool called in Hebrew, Beth Zasa which has five porticos. And in these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. And at once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There are many healing stories of Jesus healing people throughout the Gospels. In fact, it's one of the things that Jesus was best known for in his day. It's evidenced by all of the stories that we have of different healings that are passed down through us in the Gospels. Also, in the first centuries of Christianity, those first few decades after uh, Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, Christ, he was most, most known by Christ the physician. That was the most popular name for Jesus, especially in the first centuries. And for most part, these stories sort of follow a common theme, have a common element. The person being healed is usually, has usually sought Jesus out somehow. They've either touched him in a crowd or yelled at him from their mat from far away. Somehow they have been brought to Jesus. And then we're told in many cases that it is their faith that has made them well. That it's their faith in God that has done this amazing thing for him. Go, your faith has made you well. We've all heard that. But in this story, neither of those things are the case. Instead, this healing story is quite the opposite. Instead of someone seeking out Jesus, we see Jesus seeking this person out. We're told that he goes to the pool, sees this man, and unprovoked asks him if he wants to be made well. The man doesn't say yes or no, but Jesus heals him anyway. And when he's healed, we're not told that it has anything to do with his faith at all. In fact, as the story continues past this lection reading, we only read the first part, it keeps going. When the religious authorities are upset that he has taken up his mat on the Sabbath day, that he's been healed on the Sabbath day, he pushes the blame off on Jesus, actually, and says, yeah, go talk to that guy. We're not told anything about his faith at all, one way or the other, after this event. For the most part, as I was doing my reading this week, these are the two big things that most of the commentaries seem to focus on. That this is a story where faith is not a 
prerequisite for God's activities, and that it's Jesus's actions where he chooses to heal apart from having someone seek him out. One commentary puts it really succinctly. It says this way. It says, the lack of any request to Jesus for healing or any hint of faith on the part of the sick man prior to the cure emerges as the most prominent feature of this incident, particularly when the story is compared with the preceding one about the healing of the son of the official who begs Jesus for help and demonstrates profound faith. Okay. And yet, as I was reading and thinking about this story this week, neither of those two things are what struck, stuck out to me at first. It wasn't even the fact that Jesus was not healing on the Sabbath, which is the other thing that they sort of talk about. That's what gets the religious officials later all up in arms, was that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. No, what got me this week was, was none of this. It was not whether he had, cons had been, it's not whether the man didn't, didn't want to be healed or anything about his faith. But what got me was what he actually did say in this passage. He tells Jesus that he doesn't have anyone to pick him up or to put him into the pool. And when he tries to get in by himself, others get in before him. Now, if you're paying close attention, if you were reading along with me, you may have noticed that in the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, it does not include verse four of this passage. It goes straight from verse three to verse five. That's because most scholars think that verse four was a later addition to the text. In the earliest copies that we have of John's gospel, that verse is not there. They think that a later copyist or editor went in back and sort of put this, this passage in that talks about um, why these people were hanging around this pool and trying to get into it. Uh, they, they thought that the pool had healing properties, but only at certain times, only when the water was stirred up, perhaps by an angel of God, and only for the first person in the pool. And the man himself sort of mentions this later in verse 7. We're not given specific, but he says that he can't get in when the water is stirred up. But in whatever the case is, this pool, the pool of Bethesda, or Bethesda, as some translations call it, it was for all intents and purposes part and parcel of the medical system of first century Palestine. People were at this pool because they wanted to be healed. Almost everyone around this pool in some way needed to be healed. So whether or not we know exactly how that worked is really sort of besides the point. The thing we need to know is that it was here where they thought that they would find healing. What this man tells Jesus by telling him that there's no one there to put him in the pool and that he can't get himself or he can't get in by himself is that because of his condition and because of how the system is set up to work, how they believe the system is set up to work, and because of the lack of the resources that he has available to him, he does not have access to the medical care that he needs. This man has been sitting at this pool we're told for approximately 38 years. Now the life expectancy at that time we think was somewhere around 40 years. So this man has spent the overwhelming majority of his life sitting at this pool day after day, season after season, year after year. So this is not a, I just got here and no one will help me, woe is me kind of thing. What this man is telling Jesus is that he has been in this situation long enough that it has dejected him, that it has beat him down to the point where he cannot see any hope in his situation, that there is a problem with how the system works that either intentionally or unintentionally leaves him out and forces him into living with a medical condition that has afflicted him for most of his entire life. The system has failed him. And I think that was of clear concern to Jesus. Maybe that's why Jesus healed him. For years now, especially in recent weeks, we as a community and as a nation have been having lots of conversations about people's 
rights to the access to the types of medical and health care that they need. And so perhaps we can look at this interaction with Jesus and this man as a guide for how we might understand those conversations that we're having today. The first thing that Jesus does after going up to this man is that he listens to him. Jesus listens to the person who is directly affected by the system and how it is currently set up. He trusts that what the man is telling him is true. Jesus doesn't try to tell him that he's wrong or tell him to lift himself up by his bootstraps or to give him some other reason for the situation that he's in. And so the question for us today might be this. Do we trust people when they tell us what is wrong with the systems that they are a part of? Do we listen to the people most directly affected by the systems and services that they are in need of? Do we trust them to tell us what they need when it comes to their medical care, their health care? Jesus did. He listened and he trusted. But Jesus didn't just listen. He provided the healing, the care that the man needed. Jesus doesn't, to be sure though, he doesn't just wait for the waters of the pool to stir again. This man had been waiting long enough. Jesus offers the man healing that he has been searching for right then and right there. And we're not Jesus, so we can't offer that kind of healing. But there are other ways that we can follow Jesus' example. The early church did. One of the things that the early church was most known for was taking care of people when no one else would. They were particularly known for caring for infants who had literally been thrown out on the streets. They would take them in. The early office of the deacon was set up from the earliest times to care for those in the community who needed support and compassion and care. And then as the church developed in more recent times, several denominations set up their own hospitals, trying to bring greater access to health care for more and more people. Now, the church hasn't always done that perfectly or even well. But they have followed the example to try to create more access. And if we listen to Jesus, if we follow his example, listening to the people who are telling us what the problems actually are, and then work with them to figure out how to bring about healing, then I think we will at least be on the right path. So let us go forth and do it, and listen, and trust. In the name of the one who creates, redeems, and sustains us. Amen.
As we remain standing, let us affirm our faith using a uh, potentially new creed for us today. This is uh, known as the Immigrants' Creed. It is modeled off of the Apostles' Creed and written by uh, one of the presbyters of the Presbyterian Church. But let us affirm our faith. I believe in Almighty God, who guided the people in exile and in Exodus, the God of Joseph in Egypt and Daniel in Babylon, the God of foreigners and immigrants. I believe in Jesus Christ, a displaced Galilean who was born away from his people and his home, who fled his country with his parents when his life was in danger, and returning to his own country, suffered the oppression of the tyrant Pontius Pilate, the servant of a foreign power, who then was persecuted, beaten, and finally tortured, accused and condemned to death unjustly. But on the third day, this scorned Jesus rose from the dead, not as a foreigner, but to offer us citizenship in heaven. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the eternal immigrant from God's kingdom among us, who speaks all languages, lives in all countries, and reunites all races. I believe that the church is a secure home for the foreigner and for all believers who constitute it, who speak the same language and have the same purpose. I believe that the communion of saints begins when we accept the diversity of the saints. I believe in the forgiveness which makes us all equal and in the reconciliation which identifies us more than does race, language, or nationality. I believe that in the resurrection, God will unite us as one people in which all are distinct and all are alike at the same time. Beyond this world, I believe in life eternal, in which no one will be an immigrant, but all will be citizens of God's kingdom, which will never end. Amen. Please be seated. Um, so for those who didn't hear that, uh, for um, co-worker of Sherilyn Tinsley, Marcella Hollister, um, who is, you said she was sick? Marcella Hollister, she, she say that again, I'm sorry. Um, she's a co-worker of Sherilyn Tinsley. Her, um, the death of her aunt. Death of their aunt, okay the death of Marcella's aunt. Um, and then for the McAllister and the Woodruff family uh, who uh, have COVID. So God in your mercy, in our prayer. What other joys and concerns do we have this morning? Um, I have a praise. My daughter Jill is the head softball coach at Kingsway Regional High School in New Jersey. And my granddaughter Ellie's on the team and they're headed to the state uh, semifinals in softball. And that means Jill's following in her father's footsteps as a really good coach. Awesome. God in your mercy, our prayer. 
I have one that's mixed. Um, Roy Robson, who's a neighbor of my parents and also the gentleman who came here and gave the talk about the lies of Putin as pertains to the situation in Ukraine. Um, standing in line for security in Rome for the airport, he had a massive stroke. So there's praise and gratefulness for the American ER doc who's fluent in Italian, who hopped out of line and took care of him and sent him off to the hospital with instructions in Italian. But he's had brain surgery and has come through that, but there was another clot they couldn't quite get to. So prayers for his healing and for his wife's sanity as she is stuck in Rome dealing with this completely foreign language and hospital system. God in your mercy, for our prayer. I have a praise that my five week old cousin, Sunny Joy is home from the hospital and is thriving. Fantastic, God in your mercy. Yeah. We also have, um, Couple more. Uh, Ang Tang is having cataract surgery this coming Tuesday, and Miss Lottie is having surgery on Thursday for eye surgery as well. God in your mercy, for our prayer. Any others? Yeah. I will be graduating on Tuesday from a computer school. Can you say that louder? I'm sorry. And so on Tuesday, I'll be graduating from a computer school. Okay. God in your mercy, prayer. All right, let us go to God in prayer. The responsive prayer again today. I think that made it in. It did, yes, okay. So I'll pray, Lord, send out your spirit. Please join me in praying and renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O oh God, all creation lives to praise you. As the earth yields its blessings, may we honor and protect the precious gifts of this creation. And give thanks for the beauty and the healing and the sustenance that it provides for all people. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. Bless your church throughout all the ages. Leaders like Paul and Lydia, Share in the spreading of the gospel. Give to your church this day a profound sense of the mission to which you now call us. The life and the health of the world. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. You judge people with equity and guide the nations of the earth. So give to all leaders and peoples the gift of wisdom and the spirit of peace. That, me, that we may walk by your light as we serve the common good. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. You promise to be with us always through the comfort of your Holy Spirit. Give to all who suffer violence and grief and pain an enduring trust in Jesus, that joy will rise again. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. We give thanks for the many blessings of our lives that as we follow Jesus, that he journeys with us day by day, with the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Be with all who are born this day, all those who will die, that your will for them may be fulfilled that we may all come to share in your heavenly city with voices of unending praise. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, hear now this invitation to the offering. The earth has yielded its increase and God has richly blessed us. So therefore bring your tithes and offerings to God and come into God's courts with praise. pray. Giving God a spring burst forth into blossoms and witness to your love. You bless us from generation to generation with the new life of Easter faith. All that we have and all that we are come from you, O God. So we gladly share this offering. You may be blessed for the sake of Jesus Christ in whose name we pray. Amen.
you go out now into the world, have courage, hold on to what is good, render unto no one evil for evil, strengthen the weak, support the faint-hearted, honor all people, rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love, both today and forevermore. Let us all say it together, Amen. Amen. That's the um, that's the plans. Oh, it's like it's like why am I being echo through? No, you. This is that's the sign from the phone. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Uh, okay, uh, but there's also the other thing. 